Welcome to the League of Women Voters Legislative Luncheon. My name is Jennifer O'Neill. And for guests that we have today, as well as a reminder for members, the League of Women Voters of Evanston also serves Skokie. We are a nonpartisan organization whose purpose is to promote political responsibility through informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League takes action on issues. It does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. If you're not a member of the League, please consider joining us. We need you now more than ever. Visit our website. You can join there. You can also find up to the minute voter registration and vote by mail information. So despite the inability to share a meal together like we usually do, we are so pleased today to have several legislators with us. We think there will be six. We are currently at five uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from them. We're also pleased to have Helen Gagel as our moderator. Um, Helen has been very involved in community service and local politics and has served on a number of local boards, including the League of Women Voters. So I'm gonna turn it over to Helen now and she'll introduce our panel of members and we'll get started. Enjoy. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, welcome all, um, even those of you who I can't see. <laughs> um, this is a Zoom webinar, which operates somewhat differently from um, Zoom meetings you may have attended, but the point is we're all here together and hopefully everyone will be able to hear and see from our legislators. We just had notification that Senator uh, Rom Villavellum will not be able to join us. So we are down to five women legislators for the League of Women Voters, isn't that <laughs> not a surprise? Um, I do wanna go um, over the plan uh, for the people who just joined us, the legislators are already aware of this. We're gonna do kind of three rounds. So the first round, I will pose a question to each of the um, legislators present on a particular topic of interest to the League and Illinois residents at large. And she will have up to three minutes to comment on that question. And then the others can add comments um, or responses as they choose. And so we'll have a first round of five questions and maybe I'll ask the bonus question that I would have asked to the Senator had he been able to join us. Um, we're gonna begin, what I did is uh, rather than flipping a coin, uh, we're going in alphabetical order by last name. And for the second round, I will reverse that order. So everything will be eminently fair. Um, <laughs> so first up is Representative Kelly Cassidy. Um, and the topic is the fair tax amendment. You were a sponsor of the bill that um, after years of effort, finally got this issue on the ballot. Uh, the league is part of the coalition that's supporting the amendment. Now given COVID and the attendant fiscal issues <laughs> associated with it, um, how do you assess the chances of passing the amendment in November and what will be the cost of failure? I had all the heads up in the world that I should have unmuted. Sorry about that. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and uh, lucky me for the first question. Um, you know, this is something that I have been working on to get this on the ballot since my very first days in Chicago. And I, I know folks who have spent their entire adult lives working towards this. And so this is a, an opportunity that, that um, you know, we cannot squander. We do need to make sure that, that we are getting the vote out on this. And that <clears throat> in areas, in districts like mine, where 99% of the people in the district are going to uh, experience a tax cut as a result, we really need to run the table um, to, to get the voters in our areas out to make sure that we uh, have the cushion that we need to pass this statewide. Um, you know, you cited uh, the, the concerns about the pandemic and the economy, and those are very real. Um, and, but the, the, the even more real is the impact on our budget um, of failure. Um, the only way that we're really going to be able to dig out of the hole we were already in, not just uh, you know, the, how much deeper it's gotten as a result of job losses and the impact of the pandemic on, on our friends and neighbors. Um, we, this is the path out. Um, 
getting our uh, getting a, a reliable, steady revenue stream that that is fair uh, is the first key step to to um, you know the old when you're in a hole, stop digging. This will help us stop digging. And likelihood of passage, how, how optimistic are you that we can? I, honestly, I don't think any of us know what to expect from this election. Um, so rather than, than making predictions, I will make promises. And that is that I'm going to spend every waking moment between now and election day ensuring that we get the vote out for the fair tax. Thank you. Does anyone else care to comment on this? Either wave your hand and then unmute yourself or Robin? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, say that I think that we really need to uh, make every effort to let people understand what's going on here. As we know, um, income inequality is, is reaching one of its highest points again. But in 1970, when, this first, when we first had the flat tax, um, income equality was at its highest it's ever been and had been growing. So at that time, in that, that legislate, when they put together that constitution, they expected income equality to continue to grow. So um, I think the AARP has a great new ad out, which says something like, um, you don't earn money like a billionaire, why should you pay taxes like a billionaire? So uh, we're hoping that that'll be effective. There's also this interactive map that you can click on to see what percent of the people in your district will um, either pay less or the same amount of money. And uh, as Kelly said, it's like, you know, 99% in her district. I think it's about 97% in my dis in the district I represent. So mm -hmm. okay. um, it's very high. Thank you, um, Jennifer, and then Laura. I hope it's okay that I'm addressing you by first name. <laughs> it is. Can you hear me? Did I unmute? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to um, reiterate to everyone to make sure you get the facts. Uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And you can go to the governor's website and you can search the fair tax calendar. You can type in your income and you can see exactly how this will impact your family. Um, so I would encourage everyone out there to make sure that you understand what the actual impact of this would be on your family um, before you make a decision. And then I would also just like to point out that states like Minnesota and Wisconsin that have uh, graduated income taxes that they recovered from the Great Recession much more quickly without and out migration. Um, again, I think it's important to get the facts out there and make sure that people are making an informed decision. Great. Um, Laura Fine and then Heather Staines. Yeah, I just want to add to that. Um, first of all, thank you for hosting us today. But I think I remember the first day I had been elected to office, the League of Women Voters came in to talk to me about fair tax. <laughs> and this was almost eight years ago already. So um, this is something that, that people have been working on for a very long time. What I think is so important in making this decision about the fair tax when people go to vote, uh, when COVID struck, we realized how much of a role government plays in everybody's lives. And we have more people relying on government services now than we've seen in, in my lifetime. Um, we have uh, you know, the grants coming to help businesses. We have um, people who are being helped with their rent and their mortgage. And that money has to come from somewhere. And so I'm thinking that hopefully people will realize that government is there to help people and we are spending the money wisely. And this is a safety net. And this is a safety net that we have to make sure holds strong. And I'm hoping people will consider that when they go and vote. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Staines. Yeah, I'll just add the, uh, a couple quick facts. One, we're already doing that here in Illinois at the federal level. You know, it's a graduated tax rate at the federal level. This is not new. Um, I think people also don't understand most states that have an income tax do this as well. Illinois uh, of the states that have an income tax is one of the few that don't have it done in a graduated way where if you earn more, you pay a big, you know, a, a, a bigger rate. It's, it's much more standard operating procedure to do it that way already. Um, and, you know, as folks were saying, uh, I, I think the big negative people are trying to put out there about this is it makes it easier for the legislature to do tax increases, which is just, you know, I, I don't think that's a realistic 
um, response. It's the hardest vote anyone ever does. If this does not change what has to happen to change your tax rates. I mean, we still have to take a vote, whether it's a flat tax or graduated. It just changes how we distribute that tax and it can make it a lot more equitable. So as everyone here was saying, please do your homework, get the facts. Uh, I think it's really important that we try to get this passed. Great, thank you. Um, lots of good um, thoughts there. I'm glad we're recording this. Um, I wanna mention that one of our members, Kathy Tate Bradish, has really taken a leadership position for our league and elsewhere on the fair tax. And she will be churning out lots of information for league members and the community at large. Um, so we're hoping that um, certainly in Evanston, we'll have a good turnout for it. Um, next up, Representative Laura Fine, and the topic is ethics. Uh, according to the advocacy organization Reform for Illinois, our fair state ranks dead last in the United States for trust in state government. Now, I didn't get a chance to check that. I'm not all that familiar with that organization, but it's kind of scary. Um, in recent weeks, ethics reform has become a hot topic. Um, when you joined the legislature, uh, Representative Fine, or you have joined other legislators in supporting a package of reforms that will go to the General Assembly in the fall session, as I understand it. Um, tell us why you signed on, how you feel about its chances of passage, and specifically, do you believe it's time for Speaker Madigan to step down? That's a lot in one question. Uh, so where to begin? Um, I think if you asked any of us uh, about Speaker Madigan, we would have said it's been years since it's been time for the speaker to step down. Um, if you look at the faces in this Zoom alone, the whole political landscape is changing and it's time for changes in leadership as well. Um, I'm not saying that his constituents can't continue to vote him in if they, if they want to vote him in, uh, but as far as putting him in a position of leadership, we all would agree, I believe, and my colleagues will speak for themselves, that it's, it's, it's due time for a change. Uh, that being said, ethics is a hot topic now, um, as it has been for many years, but now um, we have a representative who's recently been indicted. And um, we have, what, one, two, three members of the Senate who have been as well. And this is very discouraging from those of us. And for this way, I think I can speak for all the women on the screen who are really there for all the right reasons and to get a job done, because it gives the whole legislature a black eye. And it makes everybody look bad. And what is so discouraging about that is we all have our, uh, our buckets that we're trying to work so hard on. You know, if it's Jennifer and immigration, if it's Heather and the budget, if it's Robin and human services, if it's Kelly and criminal justice reform, myself and healthcare reform, these are all issues we wanna get done for the people in the state of Illinois. And when we hear of unethical players, it's very, um, it's maddening for us because it makes it that much harder to get done what we wanna get done for our state. That being said, you are right, we are working on a package of, of reforms and um, Heather has led us in this charge moving forward. We currently do have a joint commission on ethics and lobbying reform and they're supposed to come out with their report very soon. But in the meantime, there were a group of us that signed on to these, uh, this letter that said, hey, here are our ideas and we want you to consider these ideas because we think that this can put us in the right direction. Um, number one, term limits on legislative leadership. Uh, we have that in the Senate right now, but we do not have that yet in the House. Uh, so that's something that we think is very important to start moving forward. Uh, also, policies to remove a legislator le or leader or a committee chair if they are under investigation. Uh, it is very difficult because we face the problem of innocent until proven guilty. However, we feel that, or I feel that, if you are in a uh, elected position, the bar is higher for us. And if, you, if there is a cloud over you, I'm not saying that you need to, to lose your current job, but you shouldn't be in leadership until that cloud moves away. Uh, and that's 
just how I feel that our assembly should be run. Uh, this also talks about prohibiting legislators from lobbying other elected officials from other units of government. It establishes at least a one-year probation for legislators leaving office and then becoming lobbyists. It expands disclosure of legislators' outside income. Um, it allows the Legislative Inspector General to self-initiate investigations and make, an, an independent, make it an independent agency. And it also establishes a censure process, which we do not have in the General Assembly right now. So like I said, we are in a very challenging time. Uh, you know, the, the, I talked to a state's attorney once and he said, well, we have so many people in Illinois who've been indicted or convicted because we have the laws in place that, that catch those people. <laughs> um, so I would like to say that it's because we do have some strong laws in place, but we're not the only one. Um, the Speaker of the House in Ohio has just been arrested for something similar to what we're seeing going on in Illinois right now. And we've seen it happen in Missouri too. So we've just got to make sure that our players stay good players and that we have ethics in place that weed out the bad players. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Okay, we will move on then. Uh, next question goes to Representative Gable, Robin Gable. Um, environment and clean energy are among your signature issues and among our priority areas of the league as well. We're looking at clean energy, protecting Lake Michigan, waste reduction, the whole panoply of, of environmental and climate change issues. Again, in this year of COVID, um, is there room in the budget or on the legislative agenda for meaningful action and investment in the environmental arena? And where should the state be focusing its resources these days? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, softball. So uh, <laughs> I, um, as we're, you said, we're the League of Women Voters. We're not a prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> So this issue has been top of a priority for me for, for a number of years. I really fought to try to get this on the agenda in 2019 when we had a most uh, amazing session. We passed all kinds of important legislation and I really wanted this to be on the agenda then as well. Um, there wasn't room then, but uh, there were lots of promises made that it was gonna be in the near future. Um, and then this year with the pandemic, we were not able to pass it this year either. And, um, uh, you know, it's very disconcerting. The environment's not waiting for us to decide to make some changes. The, uh, you know, the scientists came out and said, we have 10 years to, or the, if we don't do something, we are, we are doomed. So um, to me, the most important bill that we need to pass this year is the Clean Energy uh, Jobs Act, CEJA. And I know you're very familiar with it and probably most of the people listening to this are. Um, this is a very comprehensive bill. And, and the good news is, is that they did a poll on this and 82% of Illinois voters support CEJA. So it's not a Democrat issue or Republican issue. Just about everybody agrees that this is a very important issue and must be passed. Um, I think that uh, we, were, we were spending the summer uh, the beginning of the summer, there were plans to reform our work groups on this topic. Um, the work groups were transportation, which I was a member of, the power sector, equity, and the fourth committee was uh, commercial industrial buildings. Um, those work groups were suspended once um, the uh, allegations or the, 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 the uh, feds came out with the ComEd allegations and their I don't even know what to call it. But um, once that happened, uh, uh, CJA was put on hold, mainly because they wanted to make sure that it was suspended because they just wanted to make sure it didn't look like um, there was an air of uh, misconduct underneath this, um, this work. Um, we think that those work groups are going to be starting up again soon, and we are really quite hopeful that this bill will be able to be passed Probably not in veto session, because I think that's going to be very short, but we're hoping for next session for sure. Um, you know, CJA is, there's four pillars on it, and, and maybe you're familiar. The first one creates high quality jobs. 
an economic opportunity, particularly for those communities uh, in, um, in, uh, uh, that, uh, that um, have been in, in environmental justice and low income communities and communities where they're losing jobs. The uh, pillar two is for 100% renewable energy by 2050. That means getting 40 million more solar panels up. And uh, pillar three is a carbon free sector by 2030. So the difference between renewable and carbon free is, um, is uh, nuclear. So uh, we're, nuclear is kind of like the bridge between getting rid of carbon and then becoming all renewable. And then the fourth pillar, uh, my favorite, is electrifying the transportation sector. Uh, the transportation sector is the biggest polluter right now of carbon, and um, it has the most opportunity for change. So um, that, that's where we're at. I think I'm hopeful that uh, next session we'll be able to move this bill quickly. Um, and uh, that's about it. A good pillar. Does anyone else care to comment on environmental issues, either this one or another? A uh, follow-up to you, uh, Representative Gable, and then I'll go to Senator Staines. Um, what impact, if any, um, is some of the deregulation going on at the federal level having on state efforts to um, address climate change? I think it just makes it more urgent. As, uh, as they deregulate, the costs can go up here in the state, and uh, CJA would put some controls on that. So um, I think it just increases the urgency. Let me also just say that I think uh, single-use plastics is also an issue that is of utmost importance. And I know I work with the National uh, Conference of Environmental Legislators, and that's high on their agenda as well. Um, you know, we need to stop filling in these landfills, and we need to, st and you know, plastic is is uh, becoming abundant in our oceans and. Um, microplastics, it's just a very dangerous situation. So I think that we're also looking at ways to decrease uh, pla one plastic, single-use plastic. And I think both um, Jen and Laura are working on that issue as well. Right. Um, Heather Staines, did you want to add something here? I saw you raise, raise your hand. Yeah, just on another issue, and I really do, uh, Robin and uh, everyone else on the panel really is uh, doing an amazing uh, work on environmental issues. Uh, which really appreciate. Um, just lead in the drinking water pipes, that's been a big issue. I've been working on for a couple of years. We've been hoping, uh, you know, we first required uh, schools and other places to test the, for lead in their drinking water. And we found unfortunately too many places that had it. Um, you know, Illinois does have significant challenges uh, around this. So we've been working on with the Illinois Municipal League and then a lot of environmental groups and the Metropolitan Planning Council to try to come up with uh, a bill that we can get a lot of agreement around how to help fund replacing all the lead service lines that we have in our drinking water. So uh, we thought we would have, we were really close to an agreement this last session. Obviously with COVID, we didn't really have a complete session. So if we don't get to something like that in veto, we are certainly hoping to also address that uh, next session because we were really close to an agreed uh, way of trying to help pay over a number of years replacing those lead service lines. Thank you, that's very important. Um, yes, Jennifer, unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I think everybody here is part of the Green Caucus and, and all of us are committed to um, making sure that we protect our planet and feel strongly that we have no time to waste. Um, and I just wanted to take a, a quick minute to plug uh, House Bill 4888, which is my Drug Take Back Act, which uh, Laura is uh, carrying in the Senate. Um, this is a bill that's become incredibly important, especially as we've seen a rise in opioid addiction um, due to the pandemic. Um, and this is based on a true EPR model, which places the responsibility on the manufacturers of dangerous chemicals and pollutants uh, to pay for their cleanup. Uh, and to pay for uh, their recycling. And so this would uh, put in place uh, a similar structure that has been successful in other states uh, where there would be a statewide free, effective, and convenient way for consumers uh, to get medicines out of their medicine cabinets, keep them out of the black market, 
um, where drug abuse starts um, and keep it out of our waterways uh, where we know that we're finding dangerous levels of this stuff um, in our aquatic life and then it ends up in our drinking water as MWRD Commissioner Deb Shore has said they cannot filter this stuff out. Um, so this is a priority bill for me um, and I'm excited to get back to working on the issues that we know are the kitchen table things that our constituents care about. Great, thank you. Keep your microphone on because you get the next question. <laughs> and it's um, in the arena of voting. Uh, I was interested to read that you literally grew up in the women's movement, uh, going with your mom to rallies for the ERA. Um, many of us on this in this meeting have had done the same thing with our daughters. Um, and today marks the, the centennial of the ratification of the 20th Amendment. Um, I would call for a cheer, but we can't do that on Zoom. Um, a century after that event and a half century since voting rights were guaranteed for people of color, universal suffrage is in jeopardy in many states and in all states if voting by mail is restricted. Uh, we in the League were happy that our legislature took action to expand our state's voting by mail program. But looking at what's going on nationally, is there anything further the state can or should do to ensure that uh, we have the right to vote safely this year and that all of our votes will actually be counted? Yes, um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, I think this group sounds like you're familiar with the bill that we passed in the special session to improve opportunities to vote by mail in the, in the November election in response to uh, the public health concerns related to in-person voting. Um, and vote by mail and no excuse absentee voting has long been recognized as safe and reliable um, and an important mechanism for voting, especially this November. Um, as I was reiterated um, by numerous speakers at the, the convention the other night, it's important that everybody puts together a plan to make sure that their voice is heard. Um, if you're going to vote by mail, I would encourage folks to make sure that they return it uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and the other thing I, that I, I would encourage every, you know, folks to do is to make sure that um, you continue to put pressure on, um, on uh, the Trump administration um, and uh, our Attorney General Kwame Raul to investigate any violations to election law um, to knowingly and deliberately delay delivery of ballots in the November general election. Um, I signed on to a letter with the House Democratic Women's Caucus um, challenging uh, the Trump administration's uh, stated um, uh, changes to the US Postal Service um, I think in the last 24 hours, we've heard that they are going to delay any changes until after the election. Um, but, you know, this is, this is um, critical to our democracy. Um, and as you said, um, I grew up with League of Women Voters meetings in my living room. Um, making my voice heard has become a part of my DNA my entire life. I cannot imagine a scenario where I would wake up on November 4th and be concerned that the very foundations of our democracy have been in jeopardy because people did not have the opportunity to either uh, cast their ballot in person um, or uh, have their absentee or their vote by mail ballots counted uh, because of games being played uh, with the Postal Service. Um, so I know that uh, the Illinois delegation is working hard um, with Congress to make sure that uh, the uh, Postmaster General is uh, called to account for how they are going to make sure that all of the uh, vote by mail ballots are um, distributed and uh, d done so on time. Um, but I think it's important to have uh, grassroots efforts around this issue to ensure that we continue to hold the administration's feet to the fire on this issue because nothing short of our entire democracy is at stake here. I mean, this is literally job number one. Um, and there, um, you know, this is, and I know we say this a lot, but I truly believe this, um, this is the most consequential election of our lifetime. Um, we are facing existential threats on 
every front. And um, we need to make sure that every single person has the opportunity to make their voice heard. Um, so we're working hard to, to do what we can um, here. And uh, we need to hear your voices also. Great. Well, you know, the league is there getting out the vote. <laughs> um, anyone else want to comment on the voting rights situation or voting access? I, I, I was just going to say that um, I agree with everything Jen said. I think <laughs> it is critically important. And, um, and I just hope everybody comes out to vote. I think that we have that we made some great changes in the law that we passed in Illinois here to make sure that people have the access. One of the things that concerned me was that uh, we had heard that a fairly high percentage of people's ballots that they sent in through the mail were not being counted. And uh, that's a real concern. And I think that we passed, some part of the law that we passed um, was to ensure that their vote would be counted. So part of the bill said that the presumption of validity for every ballot that comes in and that it would take three out of three judges, some are Republicans, two, two of, only two can be of the same party, um, would have to uh, vote to, uh, if, they, if people disagree with the signature, or um, two out of three if there were other disagreements about if the ballot was valid or not. And, yet, and then they had to notify the person that, um, that their ballot was being questioned and that person had until 14 days after the election to uh, comply with any requests that were made. So I think that we really have done an excellent job of, um, of making sure that every vote will count. Uh, Kelly, Cassidy, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just want to encourage folks to get their vote by mail uh, applications in as soon as possible. Um, know that uh, the the uh, here in, in the city of Chicago, and, and I've talked to the county party as well, all the early voting sites are going to have um, drop boxes so that you can deliver your ballot in person but not have to uh, vote in person. You can also choose to vote in person, just bring your vote by mail ballot with you. But the best thing for everyone right now to do as soon as we're done with this luncheon is go on to the Board of Elections website and put in your application for a vote by mail ballot. If there's anyone, any league member on this call who hasn't already done this, I don't want to know your name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add one thing? Has her hand up, but before I, I go to you, I'm, I'm curious, uh, one of our, one of the emphases that, that the league is going to be, our league is going to be, um, working on this fall in particular is voter turnout of younger voters. And uh, we're hopeful that we can increase the percentage a bit. And I'm wondering if any of you have, are hearing more from younger voters these days, particularly about issues like climate change and, and others. But I'll go to Jennifer Gong Gershowitz right now. You wanted to add something? Yeah, well, the thing I wanted to add is related to that. I, I just recently got an email about the drop boxes um, for for the 17th district. And the, uh, the, the drop box for the 17th district is gonna be located at the Skokie, it's in Skokie. Um, so for folks who don't wanna put it in the mail, cause they don't, I, I'm hearing from constituents that they're worried about the mail, right. um, that they're ordering or they're, they're signing up to get their you know, absentee ballot, but they're worried about sticking it in the mail. So if you wanna put it in a drop box, there will be a drop box at the Skokie early voting location and you can put it in there. Um, so that, I just wanted to add that, but then as far as uh, younger voters, um, I think it's, it's related to uh, a bill that the General Assembly passed um, to have civics education in high school. And I'm hearing and getting letters from uh, students in the civics classes, which is fabulous. They now know who their representatives are. They're writing us about issues. And I'm hearing that many of them voted, uh, are, uh, registered to vote when the league came to the high schools. Um, they said, oh, well, I voted when the league came to my high school. They set up a table. Um, and so I, you know, I don't have anything to compare it to because I'm one of the newbies here, but um, I feel like young people are really engaged. Okay, anyone else on the voting issues? Uh, Laura Fine. Um, I just want to add that uh, the vote by mail bill that was passed also puts in a lot of protections if you decide you'd rather vote on election day. Uh, the bill says that it will be a school holiday that day to make sure that the kids are safe and um, that the area is not congested where people are going to vote. And we also lowered the age of an election judge to 16. 
uh, because we know that there are a lot of seniors who are currently election judges who are going to be very afraid to be an election judge during the time of COVID. Uh, so with these other safety measures in place, we are hoping that people will cast a ballot and be comfortable casting the ballot whichever way they choose. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going on to um, fiscal issues now, and we've got a little extra time, and it may take a little extra time. I want to pose the initial question to Senator Staines, um, and I think you have the longest tenure among this group of legislators. Have, we were first elected in 2008, um, so it's only appropriate that you get the question about the perilous state of our finances. <laughs> um, having dealt with it for so long. You are a leader in key committees, appropriations, Medicaid oversight, pensions, among others. Um, and so I know that you have a broad outlook and a great deal of expertise in this arena. The budget for fiscal year, that the fiscal year that started on July 1st included um, 6.6 .6 billion in borrowed money. Um, and I think that's, that is money we don't yet have, as I understand it. Add to that the cost of COVID, subtract the revenue that won't come in due to the lost economic activity from the pandemic. Um, how do you see the state navigating this path? And how dependent are we on another infusion of federal funds, which may or may not be coming? Yes. No. Uh it is uh, perilous is a good word, uh, I think, to talk about the state of the fiscal challenges in, in Illinois. Um, so yes, when the, the governor first introduces a budget in February, and between the time in February when he introduced his budget, the time he had to pass the budget by the end of May, the revenue estimates had dropped over 15% um, because of the pandemic. So we saw a steep drop in income tax, sales tax. Uh, the only place we've seen an increase is cannabis revenue. Um, everything else has been going down significantly in what the estimates are. And uh, we as the negotiators on the budget uh, had a choice. Um, do we want to scale back spending during this pandemic and the challenges that we're seeing post George Floyd? Or do we want to try to stay the course and see whether we get an additional um, federal stimulus, which at the time was looking uh, very hopeful in the conversations. Uh, and we also know we had the fair tax on the ballot in November. And, um, you know, when you, because of the nature of our, we clearly chose by the nature of what you're talking about with the borrowing really replacing the lost revenue, um, we chose the course of staying steady. We did not make any increases in the budget. So for example, for the first time since we passed the new increased education funding formula, We've been putting in 350 million new dollars into the education funding formula each year. We did not do that this year. We were holding everything steady, um, which really, you know, in a lot of ways means sort of cuts because costs go up, but at least it was trying to toe the line because during this pandemic, you just have increased needs as, as we've all seen. Um, people are hurting. The unemployment rate's been going up, uh, on insurance going up for healthcare. So it's not the time that we wanted to make cuts in our big spending areas. Our budget, 25% of it in the general revenue fund is spent on, on pensions. Um, so the, the, you, we couldn't make a change there. Um, you know, the, then the other two big pieces by, by long shot are Medicaid, uh, which is healthcare for the poor and education. Um, so to really try to address that, that's where we'd be having to make cuts. And then trying to do that during the pandemic when clearly people have a higher need for healthcare coverage and with education, with all of our school districts having to contend with remote learning and making all the changes to try to accommodate that, uh, we did not think that was wise. So we are towing that course um, and built in borrowing with the assumption that one, hopefully we won't actually have to do the borrowing. There's been no borrowing actually done to date um, because we are hoping that the federal government will in fact do another stimulus. Um, the HEROES Act that was passed by the, uh, by the House includes a trillion dollars for state and municipal governments. Uh, obviously that has to get negotiated with the Senate and the, and the administration and they've been getting bogged down now. I think everyone had thought we were gonna get something because there's such need. I don't know where that stands right now, but clearly after November, if they haven't done it by then, we certainly have a hope and expectation that they will get back to it. And then also the fair tax. 
and we see what happens with a fair tax. Um, so I do think that after the elections, uh, when we come back into veto session or um, at the early stages in January before the new General Assembly is installed, is really the moment in time that we're gonna to have to make some hard choices and really re, uh, revisit the budget, depending on what's happened in all those circumstances. If the fair tax hasn't passed, if the federal government does not help, we're gonna to have to revisit, I think, a revenue vote in some other way, just in increasing the flat tax uh, or other things, um, because uh, we're not gonna be able to borrow $6 billion. And I don't think that was ever really the intent. It was put in there as a way of um, trying to stay the course till we see what happens in and additional federal right. help um, and or the fair tax. Um, the one other thing I would add is, uh, you know, uh, the, we're, what we have seen, you know, Illinois has already got a very lean budget. Um, we've already been making reductions um, in human services over the course of time. Uh, in Medicaid, we had done a big reduction. We're not exactly a high spend state in a lot of these areas. Uh, and we have certainly been seeing during the pandemic um, that we really do need to keep that safety net in place. So uh, there's a lot there that we're trying to make sure we're we're not pulling the rug out of folks right at the time where they need it, they need it the most. Anyone else want to weigh in on fiscal matters? <laughs> um, I'm going to follow up with you, Senator Staines, on the the cannabis issue. You mentioned it's a new revenue source, and I'm sitting here thinking, wow aging hippie baby boomers like me get a certain amount of, of humor in the fact that we're going to balance our, but we're going to get new revenue out of marijuana that used to be illegal. Um, never used it myself, by the way. Um, uh, so what, what is the state of the cannabis um, usage, if you will, and the revenue that is to come from it, and also the economic opportunity associated with it for entrepreneurs who want to get into that business? Yes, and then, you know, uh, we, we should have Kelly come in too. You know, she uh, was obviously very involved too in passing the legalization of cannabis as well. Uh, you know, from our viewpoint, um, we really had focused on this as a way of addressing the injustices that have happened historically from the war on drugs. And that was very much at the heart of the way we went about um, putting in place the cannabis bill. Um, so that we are, that this is one place that revenues are going up. Um, a part of that goes to the general revenue fund, but a large part of that goes to the restore, renew, reinvest initiative, which goes back into the communities that have been disproportionately hurt by the war on drugs. Uh, so 25% of the revenue goes there. Another 10% goes to community mental health and substance abuse treatment. So we're really trying to address some of the issues that have um, really been problematic. The other piece that we were doing, um, sort of a three-legged stool to that approach. That was one, we wanna make sure the revenue went back and actually did some repairing of harm. Two, um, you know, all the, the way uh, cannabis laws had been applied was very unjust. Black and brown folks, as we all know, were disproportionately arrested, charged on, uh, on cannabis issues. Um, so we were also putting in a high numbers of folks that could in fact get their records expunged uh, from these cannabis charges. Uh, we estimate over 700,000 records are eligible for expungement. That's over 400 indi 400,000 individuals who can get their records expunged. Um, so we've been uh, get, making a lot of uh, progress on, that's over a number of years, that will all happen, but a good lot level of progress has started. Uh, certainly uh, State's Attorney Kim Fox has been leading the charge on that here in Cook County. And then the third leg of the stool on this has been really trying to make sure we diversify the industry. Um, the cannabis industry nationally is incredibly white, male-owned, and operated. Um, and we want Illinois to be at the forefront of actually now um, diversifying the industry and really creating uh, minority entrepreneur and owners in the, in the industry. So we created strong uh, uh, ways of, making sh of trying to ensure that folks that have either records um, themselves in cannabis have a chance to actually have ownership here in the businesses and that these um, licenses will go to um, uh, minority, um, you know, and folks from disproportionately impacted areas um, in, in Illinois. Now we've had some delay in getting those licenses out the door because of COVID. Uh, they were supposed to have been issued already, both in the craft, we, you know, established new craft grow licenses, so smaller footprints for the big cultivation centers and new dispensary licenses. Hopefully those will go out soon. I think the administration is getting 
back in order to be letting those out soon. So uh, we don't yet know whether that will succeed. If not though, what we put in place in the bill is a point in time where we go and study and see in fact, is the industry now uh, diverse or not? And if not, uh, then we can go back and make changes to ensure we get some diversity. And Kelly, you should you know, Thank you. Yeah. Can, add in Cassidy, what, you want to add to this, please? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the points that, that Senator Staines brought up was the, the R3 program where we're dedicating some of the, the tax revenue, which, you know, sales in Illinois have been breaking records um, from day one, um, and they just continue to grow. Um, and so that, that fund um, for, the, the, for the R3 program is healthier than we anticipated um, this quickly. Um, and so the first round of grant applications are actually being scored as we speak. Um, and those first round of community-based grants from that bucket of money will be going out shortly. Um, and, and you know, one of the other things we permitted under our law is for units of local government to add um, uh, local taxes. And I just want to give Evanston a shout out for a really thoughtful approach uh, to their local tax, uh, which is going directly into reparations. So yay, Evanston, um, really well done there. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out on the ground there. Um, and then, uh, you know, back to Heather's point of the, the, uh, the licenses that are, that are about to come out. You know, we were all eagerly awaiting, um, seeing what the, the first 75 new dispensary licenses were, were gonna look like. Um, you know, we got thousands of applications um, from a very diverse pool. So we're very, very hopeful that um, this first in the nation effort um, actually bears fruit. Uh, so we're excited to see, uh, hopefully in September, the, the, the dispensary licenses, but also the craft grow, the transporter and the infuser licenses to, to really make a difference in, in the appearance of this industry. Thank you. I, I wasn't fully aware of all the um, strings attached to that legislation that sounds like it would not allow the General Assembly without a huge fight to raid that revenue source for something else. <laughs> so I think that's good. Um, all right, that's the end of our first round. We are pretty much on time. And our second round, as I think I explained at the beginning, um, you get to choose a topic you'd like to uh, talk about with the um, League and you can um, address something we've already talked about. If you've got more to say, you can choose an issue that's really important to you. Um, you might want to comment on topics on the league agenda that we've not yet touched on. And among these are criminal justice reform, economic development, affordable housing, <laughs> getting an accurate census count. These are all things that we are interested in as an advocacy organization. So um, I think because I've just about worn out Senator Staines and I was gonna do this in reverse alpha order. We'll give her a rest and I'll go back to original order. So we'll start with Kelly Cassidy. Thank you. Um, you know, we've got so much work ahead of us and you know, the, the weird impact of not having had a real session plus all of the events uh, that have come during uh, the, the quarantine and, and uh, aftermath. Um, you know, in the area of criminal justice reform, something that I've, you know, worked on for a very long time and, and is very near and dear to my heart. We've seen some of our shortcomings writ large at the national level. Um, we've gotten a lot done, but there's a, obviously a great deal more to get done. And, and a lot of my colleagues are working on specifically looking at a package around policing reform, around um, some of the, the systemic ways that we have um, neglected communities um, at actively uh, boxed them away from resources, in fact. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to being able to get back to those issues and start to, to come up with real solutions that will make a difference. Um, I'm about to reintroduce a bill that will um, eliminate the possibility of what, in Illinois doesn't have parole, we have uh, mandatory supervised release, um, and it will eliminate MSR as an option for anyone with a class four felony. Um, the, there is a huge volume of folks in our, both our county and state uh, incarceration systems uh, that are there 
on technicalities. Um, someone who has committed a very low level offense, does their time, comes out with MSR, uh, can very easily find themselves down a very slippery slope that, that leads to a lifetime of incarceration. And simply taking that big chunk of folks out of that tripwire laden uh, universe will make an enormous difference on, on our, our, our populations, both at the local and the state level. Great, thank you. Um, next up, uh, Laura Fine. Uh, so my big push until COVID hit um, and in the past many years has always been on healthcare and making sure people have affordable, accessible healthcare, no matter your income or your zip code. And prior to COVID, I had been working on telehealth to make sure that telepsychiatry is covered. And we really ironically didn't realize the importance of that legislation until COVID hit. And telehealth has been a lifeline for so many people during this whole process. And right now we are under executive order that telehealth is covered, but we are working on legislation to make sure that after the executive order expires, that people will still have access to telehealth. Um, if you talk to many of the mental health care providers, especially, um, they've been able to do group sessions, individual sessions, um, so people don't feel as isolated in their homes. And the impact of COVID on everybody's mental health is yet to be seen. And um, if you look at the number of suicides uh, that have been um, reported in these past several months due to that isolation. So telehealth is something we really need to pass. Um, also, I've been working on rate review in the state of Illinois, and I think all my colleagues will chuckle here because this is something that's been an uphill battle, which I don't see it as an uphill battle, um, that would make sure that uh, whatever rate the insurance companies are charging for your policy year is in line with what it should cost. And right now in the state of Illinois, our Department of Insurance under the Affordable Care Act um, collects the rates that the insurers are going to charge every year. And they go through them um, in an actuarial fashion to say this is valid or this is too expensive. Uh, but the department has no teeth. So if the insurance industry is charging too much, there's nothing the department can do about that. And well over 38, 30 states have that um, extra step that they can protect consumers and consumers have been protected um, in the billions of dollars as a result of that rate review. Ironically, on November 10th, there will be a case going to the Supreme Court that will be heard and that could overturn the Affordable Care Act. And so we wanna make sure that we have these protections in place so our policyholders in Illinois will get the insurance coverage that they need at an affordable price. And that's what I'm gonna be working on moving forward. How um, big a factor is the insurance lobby in this uh, <laughs> fight you're in? Uh, it's a big factor. It's a big factor. Um, they will tell you that um, we haven't seen the need to reduce the rates at all, except the department will tell you that they can't do anything about it. Um, so that's not really a valid argument. So there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, prior to COVID, we thought we reached an agreement on the legislation and then COVID hit, and that's been sort of put on the sidetrack. Um, had that legislation gone through, and we were working on that with the industry as well, and so they were in agreement with the legislation that we were trying to push forward. Um, so if the Affordable Care Act were to be overturned in November, we would have those protections in Illinois, and that's very important. And um, what many people don't know in the state is if it were to be overturned, we do have protections in the state. Um, a couple of years ago, I passed legislation that said if the Affordable Care Act is overturned, your insurance still needs to cover pre-existing conditions. So your pre-existing conditions will be covered. Um, we also have a law in Illinois that says you can stay on your parents' policy until the age of 26, even if the Affordable Care Act is overturned. So we do have some protections in place. We just want to make sure we can take that next step and make sure uh, that financial protection is in place as well. Thank you, that's important. I did not know about those um, 
um, safety laws, as it were, <laughs> that are in place mm -hmm. should the ACA, let us hope not, um, yeah. be overturned. Um, next up would be Robin Gable. What do you want to talk about that hasn't yet been addressed or talk more about? Sure. Well, I want to add on to uh, criminal justice reform, which uh, we, I really appreciate all the work that Kelly has done on that issue. Uh, my focus in criminal justice reform has been on the youth. And I've carried a bill for, for a number of years now, which says that children under the age of 13 uh, if accused of a crime should not be uh, sent to juvenile detention. Um, if they have committed that crime and are found guilty, they cannot be sent to juvenile detention. So there is no reason why pretrial they can be sent there. So we've been trying to change that law. One day in juvenile detention can change the trajectory of a child's life. Um, while they're there, they meet other uh, youth that they can then hook up with when they leave. And it's really a very dangerous place for children to be, um, as well as incredibly traumatizing. So uh, we're hopeful, I think we've worked out all the kinks and um, we're very hopeful that next year we can pass that legislation in terms of criminal justice reform. Um, and then I, I wanna mention something else that hasn't been mentioned yet. And that is that um, you know, during this pandemic, uh, one of the things that, that one of the lessons that we've learned is that all of our healthcare providers should be able to operate at the highest level of their license. So in Illinois, we've been very restrictive of uh, professional licenses. Uh, nurse practitioners can't practice without a doctor practically in the room with them. Um, and it also has been, we have not been able to get uh, certified midwives to be able to do home births where in uh, 30 something other states they can do that. We also have a hard time passing new licensures in Illinois. And as you know, the healthcare field is one of the growing fields where there are more and more people getting various various licenses for their work. Um, allopathic medicine isn't the only kind of medicine. You know, there's naturopathic medicine and they have a very difficult time getting a license here in Illinois. So uh, mainly because our state medical society has been very strong in the legislature. So uh, one of the bills that I'm working, I'm working on this issue with one of my colleagues, uh, Anna Moeller, and um, we have a bill that's called the Sunshine Bill, at Sunshine Act. And what it does is it uh, says that instead of licensures having to go through the legislature, they should be reviewed by the Department of Professional Regulations. And there should be uh, objective criteria on whether that um, particular uh, uh, cert, uh, group deserves and should have a license or not, or a certification of some kind. So up to this point, it's been very subjective. It's been who has more clout in Springfield and who can move things forward. And we feel very strongly that that should be a more objective uh, decision. Great, thank you. Um, next up, Jennifer Gong Gershowitz. What's your hot topic? Okay. Um, hi. Uh, so I, there's kind of a theme I think here with this team, which is that we are the team of uphill battle fighters. Um, <laughs> This is a team that tends to take these uh, these tough fights, um, and uh, um, you know, so no surprise. I'm incredibly proud to work with um, these fierce women. Um, I came into the General Assembly after two decades of representing immigrants, and um, in my first session, introduced and passed three bills to provide humanitarian protections for unaccompanied immigrant children, abused, abandoned, and neglected children, um, and also to provide uh, protections and access to justice for immigrants in all of our civil courts here in Illinois. And so no surprise, uh, I am carrying a, a large immigration bill um, that I'm hoping to, and I, it's so frustrating because I had gotten it out of committee. Um, I thought so early, you know, here's the eager freshman. Um, I was three weeks before the uh, end of, you know, committee deadline in the house and I had already moved my big immigration bill out of committee and then COVID hit and never went back. Um, and it really, it's an immigration right to counsel bill. A lot of people are surprised to learn that in immigration law, unlike in criminal law, um, you do not have a right to an attorney if, the, if you cannot afford one. Um, so uh, my bill would create a right to counsel in immigration proceedings for immigrants who are detained here in Illinois. Um, and th this is, would be a first step. 
Um, it, New York, by the way, has already done this. So there's already precedent for this um, in the United States. Um, so this would be modeled after New York's uh, bill um, that I think has been incredibly successful at providing access to justice and legal representation. Um, this uh, approach to, had bipartisan support um, in, in Congress. Um, years ago, I worked on a bill with Senator Feinstein that was supported by our Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky to provide um, legal counsel to unaccompanied immigrant children. It was not a partisan issue. I don't think any of us think that a two-year-old should be sitting in immigration court by themselves without a lawyer or children as young as uh, five and 13 who I have represented um, but for an active pro bono bar here in Chicago would have been trying to articulate a sex trafficking uh, grounds for asylum without an attorney. Um, and we just can't have this. We are one of the only uh, industrialized nations on earth that does not provide counsel for asylum seekers um, in, their, in their courts. So um, the United States has uh, been behind the curve for decades on this issue, and it's about time that Illinois steps up and does something about it. So uh, my bill would uh, establish um, a process through which to look into the costs of um, establishing legal uh, counsel for immigrants in detention in Illinois as a, a necessary first step. Um, I've learned in the General Assembly, we've got to get our arms around what the cost would be, um, what the volume would be, um, but then I intend to make this um, my battle uh, to make sure that we no longer have children sitting in immigration courts here in Illinois that don't have a lawyer. Uh, thank you for addressing that, and I'm curious, um, I think we all know it's a, it's a very serious issue in this state as it is elsewhere. I'm, I'm wondering what the extent of it is in Illinois, how many people are, are in jeopardy compared to say the border states where many uh, people come into the country and then they, I guess they get dispersed to other places or holding areas or whatever. Is, is there is it a factor of thousands of, of people in Illinois that are impacted by this, or do you have a sense of, of, of the extent of it? I have not seen a report of numbers recently of unaccompanied immigrant children in Illinois detention. Um, it is, you know, our, our immigration detention system is national, right? So um, whether you are detained at O'Hare or whether you are detained um, in El Paso, you can be transferred um, anywhere to any facility in the United States. And one of the problems with the reclass of, well, with the caging of immigrant children, reclassifying them as unaccompanied when they in fact had come in with their parents and then separating them and sending them out throughout the country without tying uh, their case numbers to their parents um, left our, you know, uh, our state in the situation of having unaccompanied immigrant children within our borders who may have been separated from their parents and then reclassified as unaccompanied um, when they came across with parents in Texas or in California or in New Mexico. Um, you know, so advocates have been working really hard to try and uh, stop this practice um, with limited success given the current administration. Um, I believe it's, it is a fundamental violation of international human rights standards and is likely going to be investigated um, by international bodies. But um, until that time, I think the best that we can do here in Illinois is to keep um, doing the kinds of things that we've done in Illinois. Um, Kelly Cassidy uh, carried and introduced and passed a bill to ban for-profit prisons here in Illinois. And then we heard to our horror that they were moving forward with it anyway. Um, in violation of Illinois law. So um, I know that our offices have reached out to the Attorney General to say, what can we do to make sure uh, that uh, detention facilities in Dwight don't violate Illinois law um, and detain, uh, build a for-profit you know, detention facility for, for immigrants. Um, but we have uh, you know, immigrant de de detainees here in Illinois um, who should be released you know, for humanitarian reasons due to COVID. I mean, it is um, immigration, if there is no um, 
a crime committed, and you're literally just talking about an immigration detention. So these are not violent offenders. There is no safety concern here. The idea that we would detain people during a pandemic uh, for a civil immigration uh, violation seems to me to be um, uh, against our, our own humanitarian principles. Um, and so um, I think that we've got to continue in Illinois to demand humanitarian parole uh, for immigrants in detention who are not charged with any kind of uh, criminal offense um, whatsoever, much less a, an, a violent one. But I could go off. I could go on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I do want to add on the Dwight, uh, an update on the um, the uh, for-profit center that was targeting Dwight. I, I, we won. Let's just I, like the, I'm going to cut to the chase. We actually won. Um, the, the folks in Dwight sent a letter to uh, the Department of Homeland Security that the, the way we wrote the law was airtight. They can't find a way around it. They could not even accept payment for water bills if uh, if they were if they were to actually go forward. So the the RFP has been canceled. The the zombie detention center that's been coming back up for twelve years is once and for all dead. So all right, thank you like to that. Team Immigration. We have an amazing <laughs> group of folks that work on this issue in the General Assembly and. When any of us raises the the alarm, it's like the bat signal, and everybody jumps to action. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. The uphill climbers reign. Um, Indeed. Okay, last one on this round goes to Senator Staines. Heather Staines, um, give us your two minute take or three on what you'd like to talk about that hasn't been fully addressed here. Yeah. Well, I you know I, there is one thing I think we really haven't addressed um, that is clearly. I think on uh, all of our minds uh, and high priority, and that is sort of moment in time post George Floyd, and uh, where you know just the outrage on on what what's happened, and uh, coupled along with just the disparity of impact that we see in COVID, and just uh, a deepening understanding, uh, I think, on uh, hopefully the broad public's awareness as well on just how deeply racist so many of our policies are and what we need to do to address that. Um, I do think we're gonna have a moment in time, I'm hoping in veto, uh, certainly next session if we don't for some reason have a veto, um, to really tackle um, a whole set of policies um, that the Black Caucus uh, has been having retreats around and they will sort of be, um, I think, I hope shaping an agenda around policing reform, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, changes they may want to the education system, and also economic development. Um, obviously, this wealth gap that we have um, between uh, the majority and minority populations just is untenable. Uh, we need to tackle that as well as policing reform. We really need to look at the whole gamut here. Um, and I know the Black Caucus is really taking a, a leading charge on that. And I think we, every single one of us here I know are, are committed to supporting those efforts uh, and seeing what we can get across the finish line to start really uh, more dismantling some of those systemic racist policies that uh, we've all been seeing. Thank you for um, bringing that issue to the fore. Obviously, it has to be part of our discussion, every discussion going forward. Um, and um, okay, we are heading into our final round here. And just to review, um, and I, after that, I'll turn it back to Jennifer O'Neill for some closing comments. Um, but the question we're posing in this final round comes from uh, one of our members, Betty Hayford, and I really think it's a great way to close out this um, dialogue. We'd like each of you to take two minutes or so to tell us something that could make us feel optimistic about the upcoming legislative session or attendant um, happenings in the state. I'm just going to do this random. Let's start with Laura Fine. Well, I am the eternal optimist. <laughs> so um, I think based on what everybody said and, and what Heather said, in these past few months, we've really learned a lot about where our society is right now. And many things have changed course. And I think going forward, what we're going to see in this next year is we're going to pass legislation that's going to right some of the wrongs 
that have been brought to our attention, that have been swept under the rug, and are finally going to accomplish what needs to be done when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to police reform, when it comes to criminal justice. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to learn from what's happened and uh, turn it around and get a lot done in Illinois. Okay, I like to see that. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, Jennifer von Gershowitz, what are you optimistic about? Sorry, I just need to unmute myself. Um, well, I also um, feel that we have every reason to be optimistic about the upcoming session. Um, I'm optimistic we can get our state back on track, um, get our kids back in school and get our businesses up and running. But if we're going to do this, we're going to have to work together. Um, with this team, I think we're going to make this happen. Um, and I believe this because our nation has faced tougher times than this before. And out of those tough times rose the Civil Rights Act, um, came marriage equality, and leaders like uh, RBG and President Barack Obama. Um, so for me, I just refuse to, to give in to despair or to settle. Um, I won't settle until we've restored faith in government and passed a bold agenda that tax tackles climate change, criminal justice, makes healthcare more affordable, and gives every child a high quality public education that doesn't depend on your zip code. Um, I, I think it's necessary to be optimistic and fierce to be in this job. Um, and uh, there isn't anything that I've confronted in my life that would cause me to be less than optimistic and fierce. And so we go forward um, with both of those um, and with this team locked arm in arm and, and we'll get it done. All right. Robin Gable, what are you optimistic about? So I think that, um, I mean, Heather Staines really spoke about this and this was, this was my answer to this question as well. I really feel like we're at a time when uh, we're all ready to address institutional racism. That um, it's always been in the background and, it's all, and it, there's been a little, and it hasn't been taken as seriously as it needs to be taken. And I think with the killing of George Floyd that everybody saw on TV, with the effect of, of the pandemic on uh, uh, its greater effect on brown and black people, that I think everybody now recognizes that this is not by, by accident. That this is institutional racism that has to be addressed. So I, I uh, too, am going to take the lead from our Black Caucus, which is, is uh, really working very hard to address, to come up with a platform on these issues. They have come up with, a, again, a four pillars on this, as, as, have been, as has been mentioned. One is the criminal justice reform, violence reduction, and, uh, and police accountability. That's one. The second one is healthcare and human services. And in that context, I think we're also gonna be looking at maternal mortality, which I am happy that we're going to finally be addressing uh, this, this coming session. Um, I think the third is economic access, equity, and opportunity. You know, our budget is, uh, is uh, 40 billion plus, if we look at all the match we get from the feds, what is it, Heather, 60, 65 billion dollars? I think we need to um, figure out where that money goes to. That's a lot of money and uh, make sure that that money goes out to, to start addressing and, and to look at how does institutional racism affect our distribution of those funds. Um, one of my colleagues has taken me on tours of, uh, of her district on the west side and has shown me that there are no services there. There are very, very few services, if any, there. How does our money at the state which so much of it gets dist distributed through human services, um, how does it not reach the communities that need it the most? We have to look at that. And then the fourth uh, pillar is education and workforce development. So workforce development has always been key. Um, too often people have been uh, put through these programs where they end up getting certificates and then they can't get jobs. So we have to make sure that this workforce development uh, is in areas where there are actual jobs created, where there are living wages. So I'm, uh, I'm a, a very optimistic about our chances of getting some of this done. Great. Okay, I'm gonna go next to Kelly Cassidy and we'll close it out with Senator Staines. Um, 
being the senior member here has its privileges, so you'll get the last word, Senator Staines. <laughs> Kelly Cassidy, what are you optimistic about? So I'm optimistic because of some of our newer colleagues like uh, Jen Gongershowitz and many of the other first term women uh, in particular uh, of this General Assembly who came in because they saw a problem and they came here to solve it. They didn't come here to build power. They didn't come here to stay forever. They came here to clean, clean up some messes and they've been doing that. And there are folks running uh, this year to add to their numbers. Um, the, the, the energy of the folks who've been activated in the last couple of years is battery recharging in ways that I didn't even know I needed. Um, and similarly, the, the, um, the way that younger voters are becoming engaged, we are working up and down the lakefront with, um, with, with some of the political organizations to do greater youth out outreach and youth voter engagement. Um, so those are the things that, that uh, give me uh, glimmers of hope as we continue to move forward. So thank you, Jen, and all the first term women of this General Assembly for being pretty awesome. All right, Senator Staines. Yeah, and you guys are making me feel old here. Um, <laughs> you know, I, my, my, my optimism really comes from the youth protesting and what the energy that they are bringing to it, the attention, uh, their stick with itness uh, on what those uh, Black Lives Matter leaders in particular have been achieving, I find remarkable. Um, and I think that drive is really going to ensure that the uh, initiatives that Rob was talking about, that the Black Caucus are looking at, uh, are we're going to have the right kind of uh, environment under which to really get it done. Some of the things that we need to change ha have been very institutionally challenging to do. Say, we spend less money in prisons. We should be closing prisons, moving those dollars into community-based services like that we don't have on the west and the south sides, right? Closing a prison's hard. It's getting rid of jobs in areas. People don't like it. There's entrenched um, interest groups around keeping those open when that's not the right policy. I think we have a moment in time here with all this activism to do what's right and not uh, succumb to entrenched interests. And I do think that also speaks to something that Laura had been talking about with all the ethics reform that's really needed to undergird it because um, that keeps those entrenched interests much more at the forefront, it's much more of an insider's game historically. Um, so, you know, I feel like this moment in time has a lot coming together to really try to change the culture and way things operate in Springfield. Uh, that is giving me um, much more hope at the moment. Well, thank you. Thank you all. It's been a real um, privilege and pleasure for me to have this conversation with you. And I'm sure that everyone who is um, listening in feels the same way. I love that phrase you used, um, Senator Staines, a moment in time to do what's right. So let's hope. Um, and I heard references like that in what all of you said. And um, I'm hoping that it will bring fruit. Um, thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer O'Neill, our league president, and um, keep up the good work, ladies. Thank you, Helen. Um, I, I just, I, I certainly am feeling a little bit more optimistic, knowing that you are all representing us. Um, uh, very, um, very thoughtful and uh, such, I have learned so much today, so thank you so much. Um, I wanted to mention two things. Um, the, the Evanston League has two teams of people, small teams, who can work with any, anybody who's attending here today if you need information, if you belong to an organization that would like a presentation on the Fair Tax Amendment or on, voter, uh, on voting, on registering and voting. There's information on our website um, and those two teams, um, the Fair Tax Team uh, led by um, Kathy Tate Bradish and the voter services team led by Mary Kelly uh, would be happy to work with anyone. Um, I, I wanted also to thank Helen, who was a wonderful moderator today. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank our events committee chaired by Joan Lakebrink for putting this together uh, and our Zoom host, Katie O'Neill. Uh, most of all, though, I want to thank all of you, our panelists. So, it really was um, one of the best legislative luncheons I've attended over the years. So thank you so much for coming. 
Um, and to all of you, I hope you um, stay safe and healthy. Bye.